All right, <laughs> here we are. So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome uh, Sarah Bridal tonight uh, with an extremely important topic. And whenever I give a talk, people always ask me about this topic. And I have to say, so far I had to say, um, I don't really know, you know, I don't know what the, how big the impact is. And after uh, you have written this really interesting book, you know, it gives me more enlightenment and especially I'm looking forward to this talk tonight. But I think it's, it's fair to say we, we go back for quite a while. Um, I remember that I, we met first in 1999 when I started my PhD at Cambridge. And I think you were already about uh, wrapping it up. Uh, I think you finished in 2000. Um, after that, most of your career, uh, you worked in astrophysics, applying statistics to astronomical data, especially to uncover uh, dark energy, which is a very interesting subject in itself, of course. But you did this a long time before big data was known. And now, you know, people um, talk a lot about statistics and, and a lot of data sets and what to do with the data. Um, I think the stations after that were after Cambridge University College London. And then you became a professor at Manchester. You have what I read, uh, more than 100 publications, 9,000 citations. I think you received several million pounds in grants. You probably spent them as well, I could imagine. And, uh, uh, but over the years, you developed an interest in, in problems, not only in the universe, but problems which we have here on, the, on Earth especially food and its impact. And you became quite active in that field and uh, which now led to your latest book, Food and Climate Change Without the Hot Air. Here uh, is a copy. Uh, oh, you can't, unfortunately. <laughs> Let me stop my, uh, my screen here because you can't see the book. Uh, here we are. That should do it. So here it is, the book. Um, I think a lot of the talk uh, today is about this as well. You can download it as a free ebook. You just have to uh, type it into Google. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the talk. And now I would like to hand over to you, Sarah. Wonderful. Well, it's lovely to see you, Christian, and after all these years. And uh, we've had some, some really helpful conversations about writing books. Um, uh, but uh, uh, also about astrophysics uh, many years ago. So, uh, yeah, as, as Christian said, I, um, I started out in astrophysics and trying to look at pictures like this and uh, look for extremely distorted galaxies. Uh, if you look very closely, you can, you can just about see them uh, and trying to find out where the, um, the dark matter is in our universe and use that to use the dark matter to find out more about the dark energy and uh, this led to um, a lot of work on on method development for analyzing statistical data or big data as Christian um, says um, but also um, applying that to um, big projects um, but it all goes back I guess to um, when I uh, was trying to decide what to study and I um, went back went to um, very lucky to visit Cambridge and a friend of my dad's uh, worked in Cambridge at that time and uh, he took us punting on the river and beautiful picture something like this uh, and uh, sort of showed us showed us how to understand the uh, the tides uh, on the earth uh, and derived some equations for that and I, I just uh, was was determined to study physics after that um, and so, as Christian said, lots of work on dark matter. So about five years ago, we um, put out these first, the largest ever map of dark matter in the universe um, and, and, tried, and learnt about the um, clumpiness of dark matter and the amount of dark matter in the universe. The very first results from the Dark Energy Survey, which is, uh, which is still ongoing. But that getting those first results out for me was like a big of dream come true and, uh, and my kids started at school uh, I started to think about um, sort of the next 20 years of my career and what I wanted to do with the rest of my life and uh, at about that same time I bumped into um, David Mackay who had shown 
me and my dad around Cambridge all those years ago and who had um, been really a mentor for me um, as I learned about statistics and analysing large amounts of data. And uh, so Christian and I were both in the same building in the same um, corridor as David uh, for several years um, in, in astrophysics in Cambridge and his influence was, was, was huge on anybody that he met really uh, at any seminar that he was present at. Um, so it was, was heartbreaking for me to, to bump into him around that time and, and to hear that he had terminal cancer. And he lived about six months after that. Um, but it was really a time of thinking about the meaning of life and, you know, why are we all here? And what, what can I do that would, you know, help me to understand more about what he did? Um, so he wrote this fantastic book, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which you will know very well um, through uh, Christian's fantastic book, um, I won't try to pronounce the German title, um, but really um, tailoring this uh, fantastic book written in the context of the UK and applying that to Germany. And so this is, a, you know, this is such an important topic uh, and such a, a, a leader in this field. Um, David Mackay um, is no longer with us to, to you know, do such amazing work on this, this topic. And what can we do? Um, in, in his absence and, and you know what does that tell us about really appreciating everything we have much I could say about that and that really led me to try to learn about climate change I could picture my children in 20 years time saying to me what did you do about climate change mummy and uh, me saying that I looked at the stars and I just felt that was not okay that I needed to spend some time doing something that was really going to try to help and so I learned about climate change if you haven't come across this fantastic representation before then this is showing the average temperature every year since 1850 and so um, you might notice that one side of the chart is bluer than the other and so this red part is the most recent uh, years where you can see the, the warming that's happening um, and so really that led me to try to understand what is causing this. And in, in David Mackay's final uh, lectures, he um, identified food as being one of the main um, potential levers to address climate change. Uh, and you can, this is just, just to remind us that about a quarter of all climate change comes from food. And so that includes clearing land, for agriculture, it includes um, having um, you know, the animals and growing the crops, fertilizer, but also transport, packaging, um, and uh, the, the things it takes to get the food to us as consumers. And as we look into the future, hopefully, uh, we're going to reduce fossil fuel usage, which will reduce the size of the green part of this diagram but at the same time, there are more people eating more greenhouse gas emitting foods, um, more, more um, uh, intensive foods. Um, and that is increasing this red part of the pie. And so in, in 10 years time, or if we stop burning fossil fuels now, food uh, will be the most important contributor to climate change. Excuse me. So um, just if you're wanting to look in more detail at that, then you can study these slides um, to your heart's content. But this is just um, one of the, the places that that number comes from. You can see here food, uh, including agriculture, livestock, crops, land use change, um, and the different gases that are involved are, are, are different with food compared to the other, uh, the, the other types of climate change. And if you want to spend your whole uh, week thinking about this, then you can look at this very detailed version, which I'll link to in the um, in the slides when you can, if you want to look at them later. But you can even see on this diagram rice paddies uh, on this diagram, for example, an enteric fermentation, which is which is cow burps and, and sheep burps mainly. Uh, hours of fun. And so this includes all these different parts of the food supply chain um, all the way through uh, to the consumer. 
Okay, so this is kind of depressing. What can we do about this? Well, it turns out that food is not only a big contributor to climate change, but it also has great potential to help with climate change. And one of the reasons for that is that different foods cause very different amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. So if we think about these two choices here, which do you think causes more greenhouse gas emissions, uh, um, eight ounce steak and uh, chips or a jacket potato and beans. Now I'm not gonna do a poll for this question. You might be able to guess already, but um, the research shows that the size of the difference is very often not expected or appreciated um, by people. So how different do you think these two different options are? And even if you include the impacts of cooking, um, it still turns out that it's about over a factor of 20 difference between the steak uh, dinner and the potato and beans dinner. Is the Amazon rainforest uh, land clearance included in the 25% calculation? Yes. So that does include the um, cutting down of trees. Um, it doesn't include the opportunity cost of not having no trees there in the, in the next years to come. Uh, that's, that's a separate extra number that would make that even bigger. But the actual cutting down of the trees and the carbon that's released in doing that is included in that number. Um, so we're going to do and do use the chat. We'll, I'll try and keep up. I do use the chat to ask questions because I'm going to ask you some questions now and you'll probably have um, a few questions about this. So I'm just going to try. Uh, we're going to try some polls um, to sort of stimulate um, discussion about this. And so I've got a question for you now, which um, Christian has very helpfully um, done very quickly and actually got it working in time. So thank you for doing that, Christian. And so this first question is, which do you think causes the most uh, contribution to climate change? So is it a bowl of cereal? Um, a latte is a large latte or two boiled eggs. So have a guess and feel free to ask me questions about this in the chat. Just going to pause for a moment while you um, enter your uh, answers. Sarah, is the, the boiling, uh, the energy for boiling the egg included? It is included, yes. So we'll just wait while you send in your answers and, and at some point Christian will stop the poll and share the results. And feel free okay, to we have, uh, we have about um, 82 of 100. So I think I'm gonna stop this. Great. And I'll show you the results. Okay, see what you think. Okay, so we've got um, about 60, well, over 60%. So over about two thirds for a latte. And then the other two are split fairly evenly between those two options. Great. And if you had to choose, well, it's pretty tough as to which is, uh, I didn't ask you which was second and third to die, but that's another question that you could ask. So I'm going to show you now the breakdown of how all the different components of those things add up. So you can see there um, the boiling of the eggs, um, as Christian asked about. So boiling the water using a global average for the energy uh, consumption. Um, for that, uh, that's actually not a, a huge contribution to the total egg uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And if we look at something like the bowl of cereal, then what you can see is that the cereal itself is not ter terribly important. It really comes down to the milk, the amount of milk. So always drink up that last bit in the bowl. My, uh, get to, uh, my, my kids will be annoyed at me for telling them to <laughs> drink up the last bit of milk in the bowl um, and maybe put a bit less milk on next time. But the latte, um, if, if you have a large latte in a coffee shop, then that could be 500 mils of milk, um, which would be more than you would put on a typical bowl of cereal. And so that then actually dominates over the cardboard cup overheating the milk, the sugar, the coffee itself, um, even the plastic carton, um, if you use a plastic carton for the milk. So it's really what's in the carton that's important when it comes to milk. Um, so that's really about the quantity um, of milk there. 
And if you had just a small amount of milk in your tea or coffee, then that would be very, um, very insignificant. Uh, and, uh, whereas if you have, you know, basically an entire cup of milk with some coffee in it, then that can become very important. Is there a big difference between organic, conventional milk, eggs or beef? Great question. Um, so um, there's studies which look at the difference between organic and conventional farming for all the different uh, types of foods. And the answer is different depending on, on the food. For animal products, usually organic is a bit higher because of the better animal welfare. The animals are grown more slowly or the, 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 there's less volume of milk per day per cow. Um, and so generally organic tends to be a little bit worse for the climate, but of course there are lots of other benefits in terms of biodiversity. So just focusing on climate change on average, there is not a big difference um, in terms of organic versus conventional. That's a good question. Why is the latte shown including the milk carton and cup? Yeah, I was wondering that actually when I just looked at it. <laughs> That's a good question. I think I've grouped the milk uh, and the carton all together in the, uh, in, the, in the bowl of cereal. But the main thing you can see there is that the milk carton is less than 5% of the total emissions. And that's even if you're having a, a one pint carton. Uh, so quite a small uh, plastic carton. Um, a bigger carton would be more efficient, of course. Uh, what's the CO2 emission for plant-based milk? Great question. So. Um, the academic studies show the greenhouse gas emissions for plant-based milk is less than half of that for dairy milk. Mm -hmm. And then really it comes down to lots of details about the plant-based milk, about the packaging, about the transport, about the refrigeration in the supermarket. So that the actual details of which type of plant-based milk are less important than the decisions that are made in producing that milk and, and bringing it to the consumer. Um, and really, then you'd have to ask exactly what whether renewables were used, for example, in producing that milk. And so you might want to look at some milks uh, do have the information. Oatly, for example, has the information on the packet there that they've had done by an independent company. So um, that's uh, that you can find out details on that, but generally less than half. So yeah, coffee, uh, that, that often comes as a surprise to people that, that the coffee itself is relatively small impact. I mean, a large part of it is that the amount of coffee that you put in a, in a cup of coffee is relatively small. Um, coffee, be, coffee is slightly worse um, for climate change than tea. Uh, tea, you're really just cutting leaves off, whereas coffee, you've got to produce these coffee cherry fruits and then you've got to extract the beans and roast and so on. So there's, there is a bit of a difference between coffee and tea. But in general, <laughs> this includes all the transportation of the coffee from the other side of the world as well. It's just that the quantity of coffee is really very small compared to the quantity of milk is the way that I think about it. That's a good question, though. Shall we move on to the next poll? Um, so the next poll is about a chicken sandwich or a cheese sandwich or a peanut butter and jam sandwich. There's about 50 grams of chicken, 50 grams of cheese, and about 20 grams of peanut butter because 50 grams is really a lot of peanut butter to eat in one sandwich. I did try it uh, for the research purposes of research. Um, so which do you think causes the most climate change? And if you, if you already know the answer to that, or if you think that's too easy, then have a think for yourself about which do you think is second and which do you think is third? I'm gonna put my answer in here. Okay, and I'm just gonna check there's a question there. Oh no, that's not a question. Okay, so we're just doing a poll, waiting for the answers to come in and see what you think is gonna cause the most climate change. I apologize, the picture actually looks like it's for a ham sandwich, but that's a different, uh, that's a different question we could talk about as well. <laughs> okay, calling at about 87. Um, <laughs> Let me stop this and then, well, there's still a few votes coming in, 1992. Okay, so I think statistically that will be in order. Excellent. I'll come back to the permaculture tea later. Okay, great. Well, that's really interesting. So, yeah, so the chicken sandwich is just one, but it's very close between the chicken and cheese sandwich. Uh, and the peanut butter is 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 not a negligible. You know, twenty percent of people are going for that one. 
So I think this is a really interesting question because I suppose there's a perception that vegetarian foods are generally better than um, animal products. Um, in fact, when we look at the results, then chicken is on average for Europe, slightly lower greenhouse gas emissions per gram than for cheese. And I suppose that's really coming back to, um, it takes 10 kilograms of milk to produce one kilogram of cheese. And then um, in terms of um, producing the milk, of course, it's, it's back to cows, cows being ruminants, and about 5% of all the calories eaten by a cow are then burped out as methane. So, and methane is about 30 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide per, per kilogram. So cheese there, it comes out a little bit higher. Um, chicken, there's other issues about feeding, mostly to do with feeding the chickens. So where does that food come from? And some significant amount of the feed uh, contributions to climate change are because we need to give chickens protein and often that comes from soy. And soy involves the deforestation that we, that we talked about earlier, thanks to that question. Um, so there are emissions from chicken and if we gave chickens different types of food, uh, one type of um, new chicken feed is actually insects. Uh, so growing insects that are fed on food waste um, and then feeding the chickens those insects um, because chickens actually eat insects in the, in the wild, not soybeans. Um, so that's not uh, a ridiculous thing to do there. That can actually help to reduce emissions, for example. And even though the peanuts are transported from a long way away, and they can come by boat and it's really not a big deal. Um, there we go. So I'll just, uh, there's a good question here about uh, tea leaves being boiled by solar energy. Um, in fact, it might turn out to be climate positive. Um, so if the, tea leaf, if the tea plants are there for a long time, they may be increasing the amount of carbon in the soil and that actually could be um, net uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions if all the other parts are done uh, with no emissions. Um, what about other types of meat compared to cheese? That's a good question. I can show a slide about that later, maybe. Um, I could, uh, uh, there's a question about cheese from goats or sheep. So it turns out that most cheese comes from ruminant animals. So that's animals which have um, uh, this rumen compartment in the stomach, which contains microbes that convert some food into methane. I was, I was very curious to see if there are any animals that we can get milk from that, uh, that come from uh, non-ruminant animals. So actually pigs, you can milk a pig, but they really don't like it. Uh, it doesn't go well. Uh, you can also milk donkeys and horses, and those are not ruminants. I've not seen a calculation of the climate impacts of uh, donkey or horse milk, but it might be lower. Um, because they're ruminants, but they're also, they're not ruminants, but they're also very big animals and they tend to be less efficient at turning food into protein. So I'm not sure that horse cheese is going to be very popular anyway. Um, we'll, we can see. Uh, good. About, uh, just briefly about other types of meat. If we were to have ham instead of chicken, then that would be a very similar a climate impact to cheese. If we had beef, it would be um, a lot more. Um, and so um, chicken actually is, is, is at the lower end of the um, impacts for meat, um, of the commonly eaten meat meats. Are camels ruminants? I'm going to have to Google that later unless somebody can Google it now. I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. OK, we've got another poll now. So a small bar of chocolate, milk chocolate, 25 grams, a regular sized packet of crisps, or a regular sized banana, which do you think causes the most climate change? Oh, I should have both myself, I guess. Uh, let's see if I can remember. Oh yes.
Okay, I can see more difference now in the votes. Um, okay, let's see. Let's wait a few more seconds and then almost everybody's voting. That's quite nice. <laughs> cool. In my lecture. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's stop it. Right, okay. So you've gone for the milk chocolate there. Uh, pretty overwhelming. Um, some interest in the banana though, um, and the, the crisps uh, not, not far behind the banana. Okay, so let's reveal. Now I should say that all of these charts that I'm showing you are on the same scale. So all of these charts here are on the same scale as the previous slides. So the biggest takeaway from this slide is actually that all the numbers are quite small for these snacks. You can hardly see them on this, this scale because I wanted to keep the scale the same for all of the things that I'm showing you. Um, but yes, so 75% of you are correct that um, a, tw a 25 gram bar of milk chocolate causes more emissions, more climate impact than crisps or a banana. And you can see there the breakdown of the milk, the processing, the sugar and the cocoa so actually there's, there's more than 25 grams of milk in a 25 gram bar of milk chocolate. So how does that happen? It's because um, we actually powder milk and then we put powdered milk into a bar of chocolate. Uh, and so when you powder milk, then you reduce the weight of the, the milk um, by, you concentrate it by a factor of about, uh, about 10. So you actually do have, um, so quite a bit of milk in there, but um, it's still a very small bar of chocolate. Um, and so overall, it doesn't add up to very much. The banana, a lot of people are surprised by the banana because you might think the banana has got to come a long way um, across the world to reach us, but that is included here. And you can see that shipping a banana by boat is really not a big deal. Now, if that banana was coming instead, or if a fruit like strawberries or, or, or blueberries or raspberries was coming by air, then it would be very different. And so we'd actually be causing um, more emissions than the chicken sandwich, for example, or the cheese sandwich. So it starts to put it in a different category, um, uh, close to the um, lower emissions animal products if things are coming by air. Sarah, what about the transport, the, the last, let's say, the last 100 kilometers by a truck? Ah, okay. Well, it is included in there. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, if it's coming by truck and you've got lots and lots of bananas on the truck, which you would normally do, then it's, it's not a huge uh, contribution. However, the very last bit of transportation where we drive to the supermarket um, is not negligible. Um, so it depends how much stuff we're buying. Um, but if we just do a trip to the supermarket um, to buy a banana, then that would be, uh, you know, that would be off the, that, that would be filling up most of the page. So it depends how far away you obviously have to go. But uh, so driving, I think it's a 40 kilometer round trip, then that's about six kilograms of, of greenhouse gas emissions, which is, you know, 6,000 in these units, which we're using here. So it does depend a bit on, on how you go to the supermarket. It's a good question. Okay. Uh, the crisp packet itself, there's a question here about that. The crisp packet itself um, turns out not to be a huge contribution, um, which is interesting, isn't it? But uh, yeah, the, that's included in this crisp number. Okay, final poll now. Uh, so this one is comparing spaghetti bolognese, uh, chicken curry and rice, or fish and chips. Uh, so there's about 125 grams of beef in the spaghetti bolognese, 125 grams of chicken in the chicken curry, and I think I put about 200 grams of fish in the fish and chips to, to make it like the ones that we buy in our local shop. So um, if you think that's too easy, then you can also be thinking in your head, which do you think is second and which do you think is third out of these options um, in your head? Because that's not in the poll, but uh, yeah, which do you think causes the most uh, contribution to climate change out of these three? So there's some interesting conversation in the chat about charcoal. Um, so yeah, absolutely. If, you, if you're going to um, grow trees, capture um, carbon dioxide um, in the trunk, 
of the tree and under the ground. And then if you turn that into um, charcoal, then you are effectively turning carbon dioxide into carbon. And it turns out that putting carbon on the soil um, actually helps to retain nutrients and reduce the amount of fertilizer that's needed. You do actually have to put energy in to turn wood into charcoal. Um, so depending on how that's done, that can cause, uh, cause um, climate change. But if you, if you can use renewables for that um, or, or, or be really efficient in the way that you're producing the charcoal, then, then that can be good. Um, yeah, it'd be great if we could do that on a large scale. I've not seen any, any work on that, uh, that making that really look feasible. But so here we go with the answers. So we've got about two thirds of people going for the um, spaghetti bolognese. Um, and then the chicken curry and rice slightly beats the fish and chips uh, in terms of producing the most climate change. OK. So um, the answers here, the biggest Thing to take away from this question is that all of these are bigger than everything else we looked at before. So dinner is probably the first place to look if you're thinking about um, how to reduce your own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and you can see in the spaghetti bolognese that that's mostly dominated by um, what I've assumed here is prime mints from a beef herd. And you can see the contribution of boiling and frying and so on. Um, and even including the canning process in, in getting canned tomatoes, if that's what you're using in the sauce. Um, the chicken tikka masala includes some dairy products as well. So some cream and some butter in there. And the rice actually um, adds a bit there because rice is generally um, grown um, underwater to reduce the amount of um, pests and, uh, and, fertile, uh, sorry, and, and um, pesticides that need to be applied. Uh, and herbicides to reduce other weeds. Um, but actually that also produces methane because rotting happens um, in the absence of oxygen under the water. Uh, the fish and chips actually, it's a bit of a cheat, a uh, bit of a trick there that they are pretty similar to the chicken tikka masala and rice. But if you had a smaller portion of fish and chips or a smaller portion of fish, then you could get it a bit lower. Um, and similarly, by using less dairy products in the chicken tikka masala, you could get that lower. But overall, these are bigger numbers than all the others. Great. So um, you can read more about this in the uh, in the in the ebook, which you can get for free. Um, lots more charts like that one, and you can also have fun playing uh, a few games here. So there's a link here um, to our climate food challenge, uh, which we developed in a big collaboration. Um, to try to get people engaged at science exhibitions and that kind of thing. So we take we used to take along iPads and uh, get people to click, you know, click lowest greenhouse gas emissions, next lowest, highest. And this is a little bit addictive. So just to warn you, if you give this a go. So I recommend that if you want to start conversations about this, it's quite a fun way to get people engaged. Um, Keep the good questions coming in the chat. That's good questions. Um, you can also download these um, flashcards. So um, there's about 72 in the latest version where we've put the greenhouse gas emissions there in terms of grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, uh, like the numbers I've been showing you. But also we've converted it into the equivalent number of minutes driving a fossil fueled car. So if you had 100 grams of steak there, that's about equivalent to driving a car for about, about half an hour. And so we often might drive a car for half an hour without thinking about it, um, but then get very worried about eating steak. So just to put that into perspective, that food's important, but it's actually, you know, there are lots of other things we, we do which are really, really important for climate change as well. And, and not least of all flying, of course, and heating. Um, so uh, they could download those and have a play with that. Uh, that's not supposed to be there. Okay. It's extra slides, which I didn't realize were there. Okay. Uh, I can talk about those if you like, but just to get um, to some other resources that you can get. So these resources are all on our website, Take a Bite Out of Climate Change. Um, and you can also um, get the flashcards there. Um, we also did a version of the flashcards for in, in India with uh, local foods and translating the, some of the words into Telugu there. Um, and you can also go to this Take a Bite Out of Climate Change website 
and make your own versions of all of those figures that I was showing you using this web tool. So you can, um, for example, enter a latte, and then you can see all the different contributions there and you can create your own versions of the foods and change the quantities and so on um, if you want to do that um, online instead of um, by pay, pen and paper. And we also in lockdown um, over the summer, we had a lot of fun uh, working with all these fantastic people. Um, we put out a video every day, every weekday in June, um, and you can download those videos, watch those videos here, where we talked about all these topics, um, we're aiming it at children, but some of the some of the discussion got quite detailed. So um, the Q&A sessions are particularly interesting. Um, and there's four worksheets there as well, also aimed at children, but um, we've got all of the work dancers there. If you want to go through all of that and all the references to that is all, all on the website. And so for example, there's kids here comparing the greenhouse gas emissions uh, for um, a, a strawberry if it's come by lorry compared to if it's come by plane, and then comparing that to the greenhouse gas emissions of banana that's come by boat. And, and sort of trying to make some versions of those, those stack charts themselves um, was really fun. And so if you want to do more on this, then um, you can subscribe to get um, very infrequent updates um, about new developments and new resources on our website if you're interested. And I'm gonna, um, I'm, I, I could talk uh, all evening, but I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, really happy to discuss some of the points you've put in the questions there already and any other questions you've got. Um, so thank you very much indeed for listening and all your great participation in the polls as well and great questions so far. Great, Sarah. Thank you very much. It's very, very interesting. And I, I think people have still lots of questions popping in. Um, so just feel free to either, you know, either um, pop out the questions directly um, just turn on your microphone or if there's other questions, uh, just write something in the in the chat and we'll be we'll happy to try to answer them. Excellent. Well, I can get started on these two uh, questions in here already, if you like. So um, great question here. How do we as consumers know which foods are transported by plane and which foods are coming by ship? And that's a great question. And it's really not easy as a consumer. And I would love to see supermarkets putting stickers on their fruit and veg saying not transported by plane. I would love to see that in supermarkets. Um, as a rough guide, anything that keeps in your fridge for a long time, like um, apples, um, oranges, and also bananas can be kept uh, for a long time in a ship in carefully controlled conditions. Um, so things that can come by ship uh, are generally things which will keep for a long time for, the, for a few weeks um, as they're transported, but things that don't keep for a long time, such as strawberries, um, uh, raspberries, blueberries, um, asparagus, green beans, those things tend to come by, by aeroplane. Now, there are some interesting, uh, tricky things here because I was talking to um, an expert on, on, uh, on avocados, actually, and he was explaining that avocados do normally come by ship, but something like pineapple or mango, that can come by ship. But if it's pre-sliced, then it's probably been sliced in the country of origin and then come by plane. So it's not even possible to say for specific types of, of food, whether they would come by, by plane or not, because it depends a bit on, on some of the processing as well. So I really want to see those stickers in supermarkets. And in fact, what I really want to see is um, labeling on all food packets uh, saying the climate impact. So grams of carbon dioxide equivalent and just some examples of that here, there's a great article which is linked in the slides. We label fridges to show their environmental impact, why not food? And Joseph Paul is a real leader in this field, um, really uh, come up with these great ideas for, for how we might show this on packets. And you can see here actually that Walker's Crisps did put uh, greenhouse gas emissions on their packets um, about 10 years ago. Um, and that included the bag uh, in, the, in the calculation. But then they stopped doing it because it turned out people were not that interested. Um, so I think that's, you know, that needs to come from the consumers. Um, consumers have a huge amount of power here. 
And um, that's why I decided to write a book. I'm not uh, the sort of person who likes writing books generally, but it seems to me that consumers need to demand this information. It's very difficult for governments to, uh, to bring this out. It looks like governments are you know, telling people what to do. Uh, food supermarkets and food producers, they really listen to the consumers. Just look at what happened with plastic um, and how they're really falling over themselves to try to do this. But you can see these numbers uh, for various foods. So corn has actually given all this information on its website for geeks like me. It's in tables there. And um, this, uh, this oat milk um, has also put the numbers there on the packet. So you can see that. And there's a couple of new ones. So um, flora butter has just started uh, giving the numbers there for greenhouse gas emissions. And there's also um, some, uh, some food outlets which have started to do that. And there's this claim that in Denmark, they're gonna do this. Now there's no details here about how that's going to work, but I'd really think this has to come from government eventually uh, as demanded by consumers. And if you want to play around with this stuff, I recommend this uh, geeky um, app, uh, which has a low, medium or high emissions value. And I'm just gonna skip to this slide here to answer the next question. Um, which is, shouldn't we be comparing the same amount of food, the food that you need to get the same amount of calories? So I think this really comes down to when you choose to eat a particular sort of food, are you thinking about the calories when you do that? Or are you really thinking, I'm going to have this portion of, of this food? Now, I think that, uh, that calories is a good one to look at because we probably all eat about the recommended uh, daily amount of calories. Otherwise we would feel hungry or we would feel um, overweight or become overweight. Um, another, another question people often ask is the amount of protein. So here I'm showing the grams of, of carbon dioxide equivalent um, caused by 45 grams of proteins. So that's roughly hundred grams of chicken. Uh, and you can see the comparison um, for, for them all having the same amount of protein. And so that's another way that people often um, ask for it to be shown. Now, actually, most people um, in Western Europe tend to eat uh, more protein than they need. So um, it's not always a useful metric. This um, We don't actually need to eat as much protein as, as we currently do. But it's still um, a big concern people have when they think about changing their diets is to make sure they're getting enough protein. So that's, uh, that's that information in terms of um, amount of protein in case you're interested in that. Great. I, I have a question um, because I get this question a lot. I mean, if, if you look, take a step a little bit further back, don't look too much into detail. Let's say generally, you know, I'm, my, my diet is, is quite a traditional diet or I, I think about switching to vegetarian or, or vegan. So on average, how much of carbon dioxide can I actually save by doing this? Yeah, so it's uh, a great question. So there are calculations done for vegetarian diet or a vegan diet. Now, it depends a bit on uh, which paper you're looking at. So there, there's different estimates depending on what you put into those vegetarian and vegan diets. Um, but the calculations typically come out at about a 30% reduction in emissions for a vegetarian diet and about a 50% reduction in emissions for a vegan diet. But obviously it depends a lot on exactly what, you're, what you are eating. We just looked up some, some numbers and it said, you know, if you have a traditional diet, you have on average about uh, 1.9 tons of CO2 per year. And the vegan has about one ton, something like this, I think. So, yeah, it depends on it depends on the assumptions about what's in that original diet, obviously, and then what's in the vegan diet. But yeah, I tend to work in terms of um, grams per day per person, just because I that's the way that I've got into doing it. And that's the sort of decisions we make. So I'm just trying to do that conversion in my head. But a typical um, average diet, uh, the average global diet causes about six kilograms per person per day of CO2e, um, so we can multiply that by 365 and divide by 1,000, uh, which come out, I think, at about two, um, two tons per person per year. Um, but uh, yeah, it depends a lot on what's in those diets. So the vegan diet um, uh, that's, that's often studied uh, comes out at about half that, so about three kilograms per person per uh, day, which would then come out at about the one ton that you just said. 
Thanks. Hi, Sarah. I'm, uh, I'm Heinz. I'm uh, co-hosting co this uh, uh, AGM Lectures of Future also together with Christian. Um, I was uh, wondering uh, if you could give a number of, of the maybe a kilogram of uh, beef, how much uh, CO2 equivalent would that, would that correspond to? Yeah, so it depends where the beef comes from, but typically yeah. for European beef, then it's about uh, about just over 40, so between 40 and 50 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent. Okay, so it's really it's really messy, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, compared to other things, so typical sort of um, vegetarian, oh, sorry, vegetables would typically be below one kilogram per kilogram. And so when, when you look at something like beef and it's coming out above 40, then it's it's certainly a lot higher. Um, and, and soy and, and those sorts of things would, would come out below one typically. Yeah. And, and maybe pork, if you compare pork and chicken with beef, how much difference do you have there? Because I noticed there is some difference there. Yeah, so pork, well, I guess we didn't talk about pigs, did we? So pigs uh, comes down a lot to the food, uh, producing the food to feed the pigs and also the manure, the way the manure is managed. So often the manure is kept for a, a long time um, and produces methane and, and degrades into methane. So um, those two things really contribute to the pig's number. So the pig, uh, the, the value for pork is typically just over 10 kilograms of, of greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram. Uh, cheese is similar to that. And then chicken, it's, it's, it's below 10, so maybe eight or so. Okay. So beef is by far uh, the most uh, the most uh, CO two emitting uh, uh, meat that we have, yeah, by far. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's that's very impressive. I was not aware of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's and a lot of people maybe know the ordering, but not this size, which is, as you say, it's quite incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's all right. I'll just show this. I'll just put this up again, which is per kilogram of protein. And you can see there's a gap there between the lamb and beef um, and then the milk and cheese a bit below that. And then the ham and, and, and other things. I mean, if you take into account energy for canning beans, then beans actually does, you know, it, it does appear there. But then if you're going to cook the beans efficiently at home, then that can be a lot lower. So it depends a lot on, on the cooking for beans on that uh, chart. Uh -huh. Where would be tofu? Uh, I tofu, think. yeah. So it depends a lot on the processing, which then depends on the kind of energy used for the processing. But it should be down at around, um, you know, similar to corn. So that's yeah, we can we can get that number if you like. Uh, I wish I'd put it on there. Actually, now you're asking it. <laughs> it's a good question. Okay, there's a couple of questions on the chat here. Should I go to these? So, indirect impacts of climate uh, food on the climate uh antibiotics and meat um costs in the health service tricky uh yeah so in fact a lot of the chemicals so pesticides herbicides don't contribute a lot to climate change but obviously can impact on biodiversity which is often a, a big concern of people interested in climate change um, in terms of the health service, uh, I guess there's a lot of questions here. So, so in fact, um, eating a lot of red meat um, is, is linked to, um, to some, uh, well, it, there's, there's health issues which lead to early death. So one could um, debate whether that is good or bad for climate change. Um, maybe that's not a very politically correct uh, conversation to have, but um, certainly if people are going to, um, uh, I guess I'm trying to think what you mean by the health service. So certainly sometimes people point out the co-benefits of, of dietary change. Um, so in fact, reducing um, the amount of red meat can, can reduce um, the costs to the health service, which is obviously a big concern for governments. Um, whether that helps to reduce climate change um, is another question which uh, is a bit more complicated to answer and controversial to answer. Uh, there's a question here about a factory cow and a Swiss Alps cow. Um, so this really um, comes down to how long the cows are alive for. So if we think about that cow eating um, about, well, um, typically eating about 40,000 calories per day, and you think about 5% of that being burped as methane, then if you're producing beef, 
then that comes down to really how long do those cows live and how fast do they grow? So a factory cow might be turned into beef at around one year old, whereas a Swiss Alp cow might live uh, for a lot longer. Um, so that would cause more greenhouse gas emissions in terms of methane. On the other hand, um, some of the greenhouse gas emissions from a factory cow um, may come from the manure management if it was really, um, you know, um, if the manure was, if they were living indoors, then the manure would probably um, be causing more methane, whereas a Swiss Alps cow would be out on the grass, uh, presumably, and, and, and that would, um, the manure would be open to the air and decomposing uh, effect efficiently into carbon dioxide because it's got good access to oxygen. I think there's another question in the chat, uh, the water footprint, how is it relevant to climate change? I mean, there is actually an, an energy number on producing fresh water. You have to pump it out of the ground. And so I, it's not on my mind how much it is actually, it's not very large, but uh, there is a number. Yeah, so I've just, uh, just gone back to the flashcards because you can see there some of the water footprints on the cards if you're interested in that. Um, but in terms of water footprint, it, yeah, it really varies massively. Obviously, rainwater is, is not an issue. Um, but on the other hand, if it, I mean, tap water in the UK, the climate impact of tap water in the UK is like 0 0.00001 kilograms per kilogram of water. It's extremely small. Um, but on the other hand, if you were looking at somewhere where the water is being extracted from underground aquifers and so on, then there'd be a bigger energy impact. On the other hand, there's much bigger environmental impacts and long term issues with, with the water than the climate impacts, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, Can I question another question about planetary health diet? I haven't heard about it, but you probably have. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very important um, report and a really, um, you know, really world leaders that have, have come up with this, uh, this diet. I mean, it's, I think, you know, it's very sensible what they say. I definitely would recommend reading the Eat Lancet report uh, where it comes out in, I mean, it's been criticised by some people uh, because it's sort of, some people say that they imply there's really one diet that everybody in the world should eat. Um, whereas obviously that's going to depend a lot on culture. Um, but yeah, and, and the other thing I suppose is that some of the news reports that came out around that time, um, like the BBC um, uh, report on this showed a, a sort of a, a photograph of what that diet might look like. And there's kind of a cup with dry beans in it. And there's like, <laughs> it looks really unappetizing the way it's displayed. So I think there's a, a bit of processing to be done there to turn that into something that people would recognize as as, as meals that they would eat. And that was, I guess, where I got kind of enjoying trying to trying to work out, including all the cooking and everything to get actual meals that are recognizable rather than something that sort of doesn't look so appetizing. But I would love to see some sort of chef challenge where, you know, chefs have to turn, you know, some of these numbers maybe into greenhouse gas emissions for their meals and try to produce a day of food um, that, that comes in at less than two kilograms. Uh, per person, for example, and then, you know, get people to vote on which one they actually think they would want to eat. Well, in, in my view, a sticker on, you know, when you go shopping as, as a normal buyer, I think it's very difficult to decide for every little product, you know, what's, what's the impact actually. Uh, I mean, we, know, we, we obviously now we know a few details, but uh, I think that would be very helpful. And then also you can have these things in comparison because if, if, if you only have one product saying 45 grams, like the package of crisps, you know, you, ho you have nowhere to put it. You know, it, it doesn't tell you anything because you have nothing to compare it to. And so I think this is actually the great thing about this book too, that you have these scales, which are all, have everything in the same scale. So you can actually say, okay, as you said, a banana uh, uh, versus some, some chocolate, but the bad things is really the ones which are very high. You know, that's that's something where you can do something about. Yeah, I mean, some people criticise my um, uh, approach here of, of saying we need labelling. Um, so one of the big criticisms of this is that people are overwhelmed already by the information on food packets and having greenhouse gas emissions numbers would be just too much information to process at the supermarket. And so I guess what I would you know, my, my take on this is actually the labeling is not just about consumers. 
So at the moment, you know, a lot of food producers are already doing great things to try to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. But at the moment, there's no way that information is, is even acknowledged anywhere in the food chain. Um, and so for that information to go on those packets for consumers would actually be already an incentive for the food producers to do more in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, even if the consumers never look at it. So there's a great example of um, sugar uh, traffic light labeling in the UK. So in the UK, um, then each food packet has a red, green or amber um, color showing if the sugar is high, medium or low. And a couple of years ago, they changed the threshold between amber and red and they told all of the food industry that these, this, this threshold was going to change. And over, I think it was six months, all of the food uh, companies that would have had their products move from the amber to the red category, they reformulated. So they changed the way the, the, way the ingredients in those products so that no products went from amber into red. I don't think many people even knew that was happening, but because those labels were on the front of the packets, then the, you know, everybody is healthier as a result um, of having less sugar. So even if consumers never even look at the labels, it can still have a really important impact. And ultimately, how do we motivate consumers? How do we motivate change? Maybe we need financial incentives. And the only route to financial incentives is to have an agreed standard, which is there, you know, we couldn't have sugar tax in the UK if we didn't have um, agreed sugar quantities on packets in the first place. Sarah, we have some, some more questions uh, in the chat. There was one question, uh, I think that you already addressed um, about the free range uh, uh, there was Marina, uh, what, which was uh, which was stating factory farming is larger scale, but in free range cows live longer and take up more space. Would you say free range meat, even if it's locally produced, is an important area to reduce consumption? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, yeah, so it turns out that so a lot of people ask, you know. Um, pasture fed cows or um, cows eating, for example, soy. So, so, so the, the intensive farming, for example, in, in the US for beef production tends to involve a lot of um, soy and um, wheat or corn in the US, um, which is, you know, produced in large areas uh, to feed these cows. So for every calorie that we eat from a cow, the cow has to eat 50 calories. So there's this big inefficiency in, in eating calories via um, a cow. Uh, and there's different numbers which are lower for, for pork, for example, it's about a factor of 10. Now, actually, um, if we're feeding cows on food that humans could eat, uh, as is done in intensive farming, it turns out there's less methane uh, per calorie than for grass. So about 6% of all calories are turned into methane if cows eat grass, but about 3% of calories are turned into methane if the cows eat this much more um, uh, higher quality feed. Uh, so there's actually a trade-off because of course you have, to, you have to clear a lot of land to produce 50 times as much food for these animals to eat. So it turns out to be quite a balanced, uh, in, and, and you know, there's, a, there's a range, but they kind of cancel out. I mean, I think that's, I mean, obviously this is, we talk about climate change here quite a lot, but I mean, biodiversity is a very big issue as well. So having having organic food production, I think is is a very important step and you rather have to say, okay, better reduce the amount of meat you eat, you know, and then the rest you do use organic production because for, for, um, uh, for uh, biodiversity, I think this is a very important question, you know. Yeah, and it depends on the product. I mean, the meat, I gave that exa those examples, um, but for, for vegetable products, then it, it tends to be, um, you know, it, it's better. So it, it depends on what you're eating much more than um, organic versus non-organic for climate change. And then you've got these other reasons uh, for, for organic food, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
and you did include also the, uh, the, the the deforesting in 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 the Amazon uh, to get the soy, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. So that's that's that contributes particularly to the chicken and and um, and pork, but also if intensively farmed beef, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we should maybe take one or two more questions, Sarah. We're yeah. coming to, to uh, more than an hour now. So um, in the chat, can you see any question uh, which you would like to pick? Well, I think, I, I think food waste is a really important one to address. So maybe I could come back to that land question, um, uh, which, which links into this, uh, this extensive uh, meat production. So, um, yeah, so CO2 from wasted food is really important. So globally, about one third of all food produced is lost or wasted. And um, that varies a lot depending on the country. Um, in a country in the UK where this study was done, about 70% of food waste happens in the home. So most people think they don't waste food as well. But actually, when you look at uh, they went through people's bins and looked at the amount of food waste. I don't fancy that job. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so food, if we're growing food, producing food that we're not eating, of course, that's wasted emissions. And if we're having six kilograms of food per person per day and, and one, you know, one third of that was wasted. Well, that's, you know, that's already uh, you know, two kilograms that we've wasted. But also when we put food waste in the rubbish bin, if we send that rubbish to landfill, then usually a landfill site is quite uh, wet. The uh, food decomposes without significant uh, oxygen. And so the, the, the carbon and the carbohydrates in that food uh, decompose um, into methane preferentially, which is then uh, per carbon atom, a 10 times more, more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And that adds an additional kilogram um, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. So food waste is a major contributor um, and that we can really all agree, I think, that we shouldn't be wasting food at least. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah, here, here in, in our community, and I think in, uh, I would say in Germany, especially Southern Germany, our food waste, we have this uh, separated uh, bins where we put in the, uh, we call it bio, bio waste, yeah? And they put it into, uh, into our biogas uh, generation farms, yeah? So the methane is not directly put into the atmosphere, but is uh, converted in energy and CO2 and water, yeah? Brilliant. Yeah, that's fantastic. So you'll be cut, cutting that one kilogram, and there'll be a, uh, there'll be a, 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 an effective decrease in that two kilograms because you've 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 actually offsetting hopefully some other emissions somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, let's maybe uh, do one last question. Okay. Sarah, what's what's your own type of diet if you have? <laughs> 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 well, it's changed a lot over the years. When I first read about this topic, I went vegan because I was so horrified at the um, amount of uh, contribution of food to climate change. Um, but of course, you know, and I, I, I stood there with my jacket potato in the oven for two hours and felt very smug. I might have popped to the shops to get some uh, green beans to have with my jacket potato. Um, and of course, uh, you know, it's possible to be vegan and to not be particularly climate friendly. Um, certainly having that oven on for two hours uh, was a significant contributor and, and, and driving to the shops and buying air freighted green beans. So nowadays I try to think a bit more broadly than just um, about vegan versus not vegan. Um, so I would say I was flexitarian. Um, I do eat waste food that would otherwise have gone to waste with animal products in it. <laughs> I did have fish and chips last night for my son's birthday. Um, so I'm not absolutist about it. But on the other hand, yeah, we do eat a lot of um, beans, lentils, chickpeas. I've really, uh, I really love them. So uh, yeah, we do have a lot, of, a lot of vegan food, but it's not, not really specifically about being vegan, I would say. Well, thank you very much. I think this, this was uh, very important to say, you know, you, you cannot only look at one thing, you have to look at the whole, uh, your whole impact you have, you know, and as you said, you know, driving to, to a farmer 30 kilometers away to, to buy one kilograms of meat um, is, is probably doing the, the opposite of what you would like to do. So, um, yeah, I guess this is a very important thing. And that's why we all have to think about not only food, we have to think about energy. Uh, and we have to think about uh, transport and and so on. But I think it's really important to realize of 
what how big the impact of food actually is. I mean, 25% is a very big number. So, so here we are. There's a lot we can do by ourselves. That's another question I get asked very often. What can we do? Uh, a lot of things, you know, you have to rely on politics, but here is something we can do. And I think the first step would be read Sarah's book, find out about um, what has the biggest impact and try to reduce that. And I think that will make a significant change.